We are exploring careers that take us out of this world. I hope you're ready to meet our final speaker for the day. Dr. Mujige Cooper is a planetary protection engineer at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California. In her role, she's responsible for keeping the universe safe from Earth's contaminants and vice versa. You could call her a real life guardian of the galaxy. At JPL, Mujige has been involved in several missions, including Mars 2020, InSight, and the Mars Science Laboratory mission. Her other interests include developing sterilization capabilities that could potentially be applied to the return samples from Mars. Mujige earned a bachelor's degree in physics from Hampton University, I went to Hampton as well, and a master's and PhD in mechanical engineering. In addition to her work at NASA, Mujige is dedicated to sharing her passion for science with the public. You may see her on TV shows such as How the Universe Works and Bill Nye Saves the World. I am super excited to have Mujige here with us today. Mujige, welcome to the program. Hey, Justin. It's so great to be here today. I'm so excited to talk with you today. I heard you have an absolutely fantastic presentation for us. Yeah, I am ready to roll if you are. Let's do it. Cool. Yeah. So just to give you a little bit of background, thank you again for the amazing introduction, Justin. Um, so yeah, I'm in planetary protection. And today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the Artemis program and then tie it into what I do. And then hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll be inspired to even be one of the first people to step foot on the surface of Mars. Who knows? It's possible. So let's start with the first picture here. And this outlines astronauts on the surface of Mars. It's an, an artist's concept of what the Artemis program will eventually look like. So Artemis is NASA's program to return astronauts to the moon by about 2024, which is meant to pave the way for the first human mission to Mars. NASA will also work with commercial partners uh, to build landers, conduct tests, and just make sure that all the technologies that we hope to use on Mars are tested and deemed to be reliable. It's just like when you're going on a big camping trip, right? You might try out your tent and your camping gear and your abilities close to home or even in your backyard, just to make sure that you have the right equipment and supplies before you venture far, far away from your home and far away from civilization. Safety is NASA's top priority. So getting human missions figured out closer to home makes sense. Testing technologies and these partnerships will lead to that first human on Mars in the safest way possible. This next slide that you see here, it's a really, it's a cartoon, but it illustrates the point that the thing about humans is that no matter where you zoom into our bodies, whether it's on our insides or outside, you'll find a lot of microorganisms, Staphylococcus, Streptococcus, E. coli, among many, many others. There are bacteria, there are more bacteria in and on our bodies than there are human cells. Uh, so before you get all freaked out about that fact, <laughs> we actually need these microbes to function and to keep, for example, our digestive health strong and fully functioning. So don't go to the bathroom and start scrubbing everything down. You need those microbes. The thing is, we need humans to build a lot of the spacecraft that are going to other planets and moons alike to Mars or Europa. And so we have to make sure we keep those germs to ourselves. And that way, if there li there's life that exists on that moon or on that planet, whether in the past or present, we'll be able to detect it without our own germs interfering with that process. It really makes it especially important to understand that, especially if we're looking for, for life, ancient life, and maybe one day, present life uh, on the surface of Europa or deep in the oceans of Europa. And that kind of leads to what I do. Uh, there's a slide here that illustrates planetary protection. There are two parts to it. Planetary protection has the first part, which is to prevent forward contamination. That's when we're going to places like Mars, we have to make sure that when we send a spacecraft there, it's built in a way and cleaned in a way that we keep our germs to ourselves and we don't spread it to other places. Uh, especially if there's a potential for finding life there. There's also a second slice of planetary protection, and that is one day we hope to bring samples back from Mars and beyond. 
And so when we bring those samples back, we have to make sure it's done in a way that protects our own biosphere, our own life here on this planet uh, from anything that might be harmful from the places that we're exploring. So those, that's the kind of two part uh, flavor to planetary protection. And that's what I do on a day to day basis. Um, you can see another slide we have here that illustrates the Mars 2020 rover, Perseverance. Perseverance, and this actually, this animation here, you can find this yourself, an interactive rover that's on mars.nasa.gov backslash mars2020. You can play around and zoom in and find out all kinds of facts about every single component that you see here. Um, and one thing that you'll find out is that we have 43 tubes that we brought with us. And out of those 43 tubes, we need to have about 37 returnable samples, but only about 20 will actually come back. And that's why a lot of the instruments that you see, if you look at the arm and you look at the mast, there are many instruments, in situ instruments, that look for biosignatures and mineralogy and all types of things that help us down select which samples are coming back. So a real life example of this is like when you go to the grocery store, right? The store is filled with food. You know, theoretically, you can bring all the food home, but we all have budgets. So in order to figure out which food you're bringing back home, sometimes it takes negotiation with your parents or your siblings to see, well, what dinners or snacks do you want to bring home? And scientists kind of do the same thing here on Earth. When they look for samples to bring back from Mars, we can only bring a small set home. And so we have to negotiate, and scientists have to negotiate with one another to find the best samples. And that might mean something different from a geologist to a biologist to a chemist. So it's just like going to the grocery store, except on a planetary scale. <laughs> And we, in planetary protection, we took over 16,000 samples of the spacecraft to make sure it was clean enough so that when we do take these samples and bring them back, that we can guarantee that when we find, if we find signs of life, that we have the highest confidence that that originated from Mars. There's another picture that I have for you here that shows what Mars, well, actually all the landing sites first, the landing sites on Mars. And these are all the places that we landed a rover uh, or a lander. So you see Viking, Pathfinder, Opportunity. Um, and there's also a place on there called Jezero Crater. And that's where we landed Perseverance. And the reason why we chose that site is if you click to the next image, this is what it looked like three and a half to four billion years ago. It looked like a lake. You can see there are streams that are flowing water in and out of the lake. And if you go to your backyard and find your nearest lake, it's quite familiar looking. Uh, if you were to look for life here on Earth, I would say go to a lake or go to a river because it's teeming. It has the highest quantity and diversity of microbial life there. So that's why we wanted to select a place like Jezero Crater. The only thing is, if you go to the next image, this is what it looks like today. So it's not teeming with water. That's what we thought it looked like three and a half to four billion years ago. But right now it's dried up. But fortunately, there are such things as fossils. Like with dinosaurs, microbes can make fossils as well. And you can see the structure in the middle of the screen. It looks like a delta. So if you're familiar with um, the Mississippi River, those big deltas that you see that structure, that's where you have a lot of sediments and where you could possibly find a lot of life that fossilized itself in those features. And so we're really excited to go to this location and see if we can find and detect signs of ancient Martian life. So this is not the first time that the rover has been on Mars. If you can see, it, I have this really cool animation of the EDL entry, descent, and landing cameras. There were seven cameras that captured the landing on Mars. There were, there were some that were facing up to see the parachute deploy. There were some facing down that saw the umbilical cord lower the, Mar the Mars rover to the surface. And so this system has been so exciting. And even though this is not the first time, we stand on the shoulders of our predecessors that told us that there is a habitable environment on Mars, and that there could, there's a place that life could have possibly exist, existed. So now is the time to search for those signs of life.
So this is so cool that this the system, this camera system was able to capture that for the very first time. Um, and there's just so much more work to be done on the surface with the rover collecting the samples. I have a, a little cute little animation of the rover looking back to the helicopter. Um, this environment is so familiar looking. If you look at the Atacama Desert or Death Valley, I mean, this is so familiar looking, but there's still so much more to explore on Mars. It's very cold. What is the environment like? What does the wind look like? What does it sound like? Um, and so there's just so much more to see and do. Um, the helicopter itself in this picture has already logged 12 successful flights. So it's already met its goal and more. It exceeded it. Uh, so I'm looking forward to what it's going to be doing in the near future. And this work would not be possible without a team. And I actually have a picture taken a few years ago of a team from JPL, um, a lot of the women uh, in our group. And it's amazing how this, no one person can say, I did, uh, I landed a rover on the surface of Mars. It takes a village. And it, this would not be possible without a team from a diverse, from diverse series of backgrounds, whether it be you know, mechanical engineers, scientists from diverse schools, uh, you know, Justin and I going to Hampton, right? There, there are many schools that come to the table uh, to make this happen and diverse cultural backgrounds. There's so much that we all shared, um, even as we were working hard, deployed at the Cape, we shared even food and information from our cultural backgrounds that made us feel closer together. And that really, it, it enlightened one another about who each person is. And so we all unite together to make such a special thing possible. And this is really only the beginning. This mission is just the first leg of a sample return mission. So I have a, a little diagram that explains that Mars 2020, if you see on the left side of the screen of the Perseverance mission, is just the first leg. We're gonna be sending so many more uh, spacecrafts of landers, fetch rovers, uh, a Mars Ascent vehicle to bring those samples back. And so there are so many more steps to come that this is just the beginning. We're just one step closer to bringing the samples back, understanding if there used to be life on, on Mars. And also with between this and the Artemis mission, it sets the stage up for that future human presence. And who knows, one of you listening today could be the first person to step foot on Mars. So the next time you think about exploring other planets or moons, whether it be Mars or the ocean worlds of Europa and beyond, keep planetary protection in mind and remember to explore responsibly. Thank you. Mujige, wow. <laughs> that was fantastic. I experienced every emotion. You inspired me. You got me sad about <laughs> the fossils that might have passed away millions of years ago on Mars. So much went into that. Wow. I'm super excited to learn more and take a little bit of a deeper dive here on your journey. So uh, one of the most important questions, I think, as you've dedicated your life, at least in the past few years, to space exploration is why do you think it's important to explore space in the first place? Yeah, I love that question because there's definitely uh, skeptics out there to say, why, why are we sending so much money in space? And it's not like there are people loading up cannons of money and shooting out, shooting it out into outer space, right? This goes to the people on Earth. People are building these spacecraft. People are, are programming the rovers, writing the code. And so this really builds up our ability to advance technology in ways that may have direct benefits immediately or down the road. The biggest benefactors to the space program are humans on Earth. So that's why I think it's important to explore other places because we learn a lot about what can exist beyond our planet, beyond our planet, and we learn more about what we can do here to make this environment better, to be better humans and take care of our planet. Yeah, awesome. I, one of the cool things that I've heard as a uh, something as a Google search that you all can make at home is like some of the NASA things that were invented as a result of us trying to figure out how to get to space, like things like LASIK eye surgery and, and many more things uh, owe themselves yeah. to that innovation. So really cool stuff. Cell phone cameras, the, the social media as we know it today and social justice even it is impacted by our ability to have a camera in our hand. And that all stems from NASA technology. 
Wow. So many of the folks that are listening today, Mujige, are middle and high school students. They're, I'm sure, pumped up by your presentation. Do you have any advice for them if they want to be an engineer at NASA? Yeah, one of the things that I tell everybody, no, it doesn't matter if you're in middle school, high school, or if you are a career pro professional, uh, a C-suite executive, I say the exact same thing. My number one bit of advice is to surround yourself with people that you trust and have your best interest at heart. It may be your parents. You may have best friends. It may be a teacher, uh, someone in your community that will, you can go to because there will be times ahead where you know, especially if you're trying to be an, a scientist or an engineer, it's a hard road. It's a road that you can achieve, a goal you can achieve, but it's going to be difficult. So you need that support group around you. And, you know, people that'll tell you, you know what, forget those people, you can do it. Or, hey, this might be an overreaction. Let's pump the brakes. So you need that person to, that you can trust to really help bounce things off of and, and really help, help support you throughout the journey. Right, right. No, it definitely makes a lot of sense. So you spoke a little bit about the fossilized remains of microorganisms that may be in the sediment. So how confident or how excited are you about the actual feasibility of finding life forms in space uh, through research like, like research going on with Perseverance? Yeah, I am so excited about that possible you know, one day in the future because we're just starting to collect samples now. I am so excited to hear, wow, we found it. We found a biosignature. And keep in mind, with the instruments that we brought on Perseverance, we cannot definitively say we found life on Mars. But you can set up all of the right pieces, like biomolecules, these molecules that only living things that we know of for life that we know of have. So that signature, you can find it, but it doesn't definitively mean you found life. But man, it answers a decent chunk of the, that question. And so that's why we have to bring the samples back to the Earth, because we have much more sensitive equipment to look at it and really be 100% sure that what we found really did originate from a living thing. But yeah, I'm got excited. It, got it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I, I, can, I can tell. It radiates off the screen. <laughs> so you know, one of the things I think you always do a great job of, Mujige, is uh, emphatically communicating about your craft and getting other people excited. So you've been on TV shows like Bill Nye Saves the World and done a lot of speaking as well. And, you know, why do you think science communication is important? Yeah, I know I'm preaching to the choir with you because you do such an amazing job as well. And I just love how you are able to reach using so many mediums, uh, the, the kids, the adults, everybody in between. And I feel that it's so important because, you know, at first I was targeting middle school, elementary school and high school students, undergrads as well. But then I realized, you know, there are people that are adults that also want to be inspired. They I've met someone that after they, they heard my lecture, they actually changed careers, which is a lot of pressure. <laughs> but I think it's important to communicate to the world what we do. And why it's important, because number one, a lot of the NASA, all of the NASA work is taxpayer funded. So everybody in the United States should understand what we're doing and why. And, and not only that, what we do is inspiring. It's exciting. And so why not spread the love of, of what we're doing? Um, I, I love to joke that the only contagion that I agree with is spreading the love of STEM and STEAM. <laughs> so that's that's just my passion and i think it's my duty it's my job to do that well i believe your energy surely is infectious Mujige, and i've been inspired <laughs> myself i'm sure the rest of us at home are inspired too so thank you so much and unfortunately that's all the time we have today for questions but please join me in giving Mujige a virtual high five and a round of applause <laughs> And make sure that you follow Mujige at Mujige to keep up. That's at M-O-O-G-E-G-A to keep up with her upcoming missions and other projects. Mujige, as always, I had so much fun speaking with you today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Justin. It's been a pleasure. And thank you all for listening out there. <laughs>